Morelli. Welcome to Inside the Fence and Beyond for the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Interesting show for you today. We're inside the fence. We'll be out in the community showing you the positive programs thought of and implemented by the almost 11,000 men and women in the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Coming up, find out why something called a sea grip has correctional officers from Mexico running for the border. Hi, I'm Michael Kelly, and I'm here with Maryland Governor Larry Hogan to urge you to speak to your kids about opioid and heroin addiction. This is having a devastating effect right here at home in Maryland and on our nation. It affects all ages and demographics. Please go to mddestinationrecovery.org. Or call 1-800-422-0009 for treatment resources before it's too late. Public safety. Stand strong with us. Present off. We begin today with a very positive story from the Division of Parole and Probation, one of the largest divisions in the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Parole and probation agents and drinking driver program monitors work in all 23 Maryland counties plus Baltimore City. And they're not just working to violate people or to send them back to jail or prison or to look for things that these clients have done wrong. They're trying to help change lives. The small office up in Elkton in the northeastern corner of the state is a great example of folks trying to make a difference. Recently, the agents there put on their very first community resource fair. Close to two dozen service providers and more than 100 parolees and probationers who desperately need their services came out to the Cecil County Health Department for the very first community resource fair organized by the Elkton Field Office of the Division of Parole and Probation. I feel good about this today because I'm able to show my folks on my caseload places that will help them become more productive and get them out of the cycle of criminality. And also, it helped me because I'd learned some places that can help when I had no answers for them before. I was like, hope for the best. Now I, I've even learned a few places. Jeremiah Bedwell can't say enough about his agent, Shantia Jackson, and her colleagues. What they've done here, trying to bring all of the many resources together in one place to help people like him stay on the right path now that they're out of court or prison. It gives us opportunities to find uh, unemployment. Um, it's really hard being a felon and not being able to get a job. So this right here gives us opportunities to come in and speak to others and to actually learn about the trades and actually get into it. And so, services yes. too. You had a lot of services yes. in there, not just jobs. Yes, there's a lot of different programs in there. Um, I've spoke to a couple of them about rehabs, about um, halfway houses and everything. And it, it, it's definitely, definitely positive. Definitely will help a lot. It was well worth it. We enjoy helping people in the community. We love to get them out so that they can get their hands in the different resources that we have. Let them know that it's life after prison. You can be successful once you're out in the community and um, just when you're released from prison. Not lost on the hard-working Elkton parole and probation staff who put this together is the goodwill they fostered here and how their effort to help may offset the incorrect image of an agent who just wants to violate everybody or send them back to court or prison. It's important for you know us as agents to help people who are disenfranchised. You know, oftentimes we look at as bad people or the people that always want to violate someone, but we're really here to help. 
We just like to communicate with people and get the resources in the community to help assist them so that they don't come back to parole and probation. In rural areas like Cecil County, getting this many service providers together in the same room felt like a triumph of epic proportions. It is very hard to, you know, find services here in Cecil County being that the area is so rural. But, you know, a lot of people that came out today, they're incited and they're, you know, willing to help the people that we serve and we're willing to help them as well. That's why we put it together. It's a victory for the agents, the service providers, and most of all for those under supervision like Jeremiah Bedwell. Extremely helpful. Great job by the Elkton Field Office in the Division of Parole and Probation. Out in Sykesville in Carroll County, the old Springfield State Hospital Center is largely occupied now by the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. That's where we have the Public Safety Education and Training Center. Basically, it's the seat of law enforcement training for the entire state of Maryland. State police, local law enforcement, correctional officers, parole and probation, everybody working in those fields is trained there, certified there, undergoes a lot of training from the folks at the Police and Correctional Training Commissions. And another thing that they do out in Sykesville that sometimes goes under the radar is national and international training. And recently, some of that international training included some very special visitors from Mexico. When Rene Gonzalez returns to Mexico, he'll remember his trip to Maryland for its shopping, its friendly residence, and the sea grip. When we escort an inmate, you usually we take the inmate with our hand like this and the arm. So they teach us that in, in that way, if the inmate moves, uh, he can uh, go away from us. So they told us that the thumb need to be together on the hand and make a C. When we make a C, we take the arm and if the inmate moves, they cannot go away from us. <laughs> it's very simple, but it's very important. Gonzalez is a correctional officer in Baja, California, Mexico. He and his fellow state and federal correctional officers spent several days at the Police and Correctional Training Center brushing up on their skills and learning some new ones. The one-week training program is a collaboration with the State Department. So far, the Training Commissions has held 16 such programs traveling all over the world or, like today's program, bringing foreign correctional officers right here to Maryland. We've trained uh, Mexico, Haiti, Belize, Suriname, Uruguay, Guyana, Jamaica. The team teaches basic techniques for responding to emergencies, special operations, cell extractions, weapons takeaway, and more. Here in Sykesville, however, learning is a two-way street. A lot of times we'll learn from them. They will give us a technique that they may have learned somewhere that we never saw. We have probably two or three things we put in our DT program that we've learned from the students down in Mexico or Belize or in the different places we've been. There are some limitations to this cross-cultural training, but Bowers said, they are straightforward enough to work through. There's things that we have to tweak, like, uh, like the first class we do, the very first morning of each school, Monday morning, we do a use of force. And we do it just to tell them how the use of force, our use of force policy relates to the training we're doing. And then we will tell them you know, their use of force policy is different. So they will, some of the stuff will be tweaked. For the most part, he said, tactics are tactics. Whether you're entering a cell and Maryland or you're in a cell to extract someone in Jamaica, it's the same techniques and nothing really changes. Speaking of those cell extraction techniques, Nazarian Romero, also with Baja California Corrections, found them to be one of a few ways that we did things differently in Maryland. Yes, there's a lot of differences. They have more uh, techniques here for the interventions or cell extractions and different techniques for formations and to recover injured men. The students graduated on Friday, April 29th. After that, they become the teachers. I'm Brandi Jefferson. Great job on the international training out there at the Police and Correctional Training Commissions. I'm Mark Vernarelli. You're watching Inside the Fence and Beyond for the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. More really interesting stories coming up.
Up next, scissors can be considered a dangerous weapon, but find out why a group of inmates is using them to help warm hearts. Welcome back to Inside the Fence and Beyond. I'm Mark Vernarelli for the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. One of our hubs for prisons in the state of Maryland is Hagerstown. Three prisons there with a staff of well over 1,500 men and women working hard on public safety issues. And there's some very interesting things that happen behind the fence at the three prisons on Roxbury Road just south of Hagerstown. Would you believe that one of the interesting things has to do with needles and thread? Sewing. Yes, male inmates are actually sewing for a cause at the Maryland Correctional Training Center. In this office in Hagerstown, it's hard to notice anything but the sounds of sewing. That sound is music to Diana Smith's ears. As volunteer activity coordinator, it's her attempt to bring a little light to what can be a dismal place, prison, and she's succeeding. I thought it would be a great thing to create jobs with recycled clothing, it's recycled art, really. Five days a week, 10 men, inmates at Maryland Correctional Training Center, create masterpieces. They're basically constructed out of used uh, inmate clothing that can no longer be reissued. We bring it down here, we cut it apart, and reassemble it into rag quilts. We've been doing this for about a year, and we have made over 90 rag quilts. Um, those there are jeans. These are here. There is a minimal amount of uh, expense involved in the program. We purchase thread. The fabric is all recycled clothing. We're making something beautiful out of nothing and we're donating it to the community. We're saving the state the uh, fees for uh, burning or landfill for all of these uh, garments, and we're providing blankets to the homeless. The program receives donations of regular fabric, too. The group has produced color quilts for auction, pillowcases, and pet blankets. They give them away to people who find themselves in need. It gives you a sense of purpose. <laughs> Manju Claggett is one of the more experienced workers in this program, and he's been sewing for less than a year. Before I came into the shop, I couldn't sew at all, you know, but I think that one of the biggest aspects of personal change is getting out of your comfort zone and actually trying something new. The precision of it, it really finds to my ability to concentrate. It's good to know that what we're doing is uh, contributing back to the society that we took from, quite frankly, as to why we're being here. Um, it's kind of a sense of redemption in that aspect. What I'm doing here is checking the inseams to make sure they stitch together before I cut. Yes, they are learning a skill, but somehow putting a needle and thread to fabric is teaching them more. This was all a new experience for me. I'm a fast learner, I catch on fast. Linnell Weeks is learning about humility. Giving back to the community. You know, that's, that's, that's my best part. You know, I'm helping somebody in need. Because I understand, you know, there's a lot of unfortunate people out there and they can't work, they can't help themselves. And I'm in a position of where I'm doing, I'm having idle time so I can give back to these people and do for these people that can't do for themselves. Bring much life to this grass. Everybody in here helps each other. Push that in. Now you can put your foot down. You know, the way that I think and the way that I see things, you know, my perspective has changed. And so now I know, I could, now I could reflect on all the people that, you know, the people, the children and everything that's out there that's going through the situations that they're going through. I can see this now, you know, and I know that any way that I can help, you know, that's where I need to be. They're eager to come to work. I mean, how many of us wish we all had jobs where everybody was eager to go to work and eager to make a difference and a change in our society? For this group, 
That's really what matters when needle and thread are put away at the end of each day. If we can do it at this institution, I don't see why we couldn't do it at every institution and really make an impact, not just statewide, but um, through the country. I'm Renata Sergi. Great job on the sewing by those inmates at MCTC, and that's one of several sewing programs in the male and female prisons across Maryland where inmates are making a difference. Across the road from the Maryland Correctional Training Center, still in the Hagerstown region, we have an old prison called the Maryland Correctional Institution Hagerstown. It's one of the oldest prisons around that's still operating, dates back to the 1930s, but it's not well known for its age, it's well known for its programs, for the things that are done for the inmates to try to help them change their lives. And a key component of life change has to do with volunteers. We could not function as a prison system, as a Department of Public Safety, without dedicated volunteers coming into the prison behind behind the fence, behind the razor wire, to try to help people change their lives. And wait till you hear the story of this volunteer who came in recently to the Maryland Correctional Institution, Hagerstown. Greg Hartman says God told him a long time ago that his plan for him involved dirt bikes. But back then, Greg didn't know the path would lead him here, standing in a pulpit in a chapel deep inside the Maryland Correctional Institution in Hagerstown, home to hundreds of medium security inmates. Greg is earning his degree in social work and is working in case management. Back when I was 13, as real as you and I are talking right now, as real as you and I are talking right now, God said to me, Greg, this is what I want you to do with your life. So back then, motocross in the X Games wasn't even a thing, but I knew that God was gonna use dirt bikes and I somehow, and he did, it was awesome. I praise God for the, I praise God for the success, I praise God for the tours, I praise God for all the wins, I praise God for the medals. It was, it was all a blast. The fun came to a screeching halt six years ago when Greg crashed during practice for the X Games in China. After winning gold and silver medals in the motocross with heart-stopping tricks, getting big air on a regular basis, Greg ended up in a coma with a traumatic brain injury, broken bones, and broken dreams. Let's pray. Dear Father, we love you so much and thank you so much for being part of this service. It, his story is one of being on the top, and losing it all, or, or perhaps it seemed like he lost it all at that time, and building something from that. And that's really what we're talking about here when we talk about inmates. Warden Denise Gelsinger says Greg is showing inmates it is possible to come back from tragedy in one's life, from nearly losing it all and having his perspective radically changed in the blink of an eye. He's been here for quite a while. He comes in four days a week. He's getting uh, really to know the inmates, get to know exactly what we do here. But what's even more fascinating about him is that his background does not lie in this at all. He's very spiritual, very faithful, and believes that God has pointed him to this path. For a long time, I miss the bike so bad. Like, uh, I, I used to travel like crazy, and I used to live out of the bag. I'd be home for a day or two and it's just to like wash the clothes and leave again. I don't miss travel, but I miss bikes so much. I, I used to pray with the guys each event, like all the guys on tour and would all like, I miss, I miss that. But nowadays uh, ESPN deemed that my sport was too dangerous. So now it doesn't even exist really. When Christ himself talked about taking care of people, one of the things he said was, he said, you came to visit me when I was in prison. I read that and I thought, Christ cares about the prisoner. I'm, I'm gonna do my internship there. He'll graduate with a degree in social work. Um, I'm not sure what his future plans are exactly, but for right now, um, he's doing his required internship and he's absolutely giving us as much as we're giving him in terms of, of just learning and growing and really seeing what can come from tragedy in one's life. Honestly, I've probably never done something this cool since I, since I used to ride dirt bikes. It wasn't strange that I chose to ride dirt bikes for a job. He's gone from a YouTube sensation to a real life inspiration. <laughs> 
I think there's a plan for all of us, and I think he may not know what the plan is right now, and we may not know. It might be something that we take away from this. It might be something that he takes away from it. It could be a little bit of both. But I think he's right exactly where he needs to be at this moment. Greg has now found a second chance in life on a slower path and without the danger, but with a much deeper meaning to him and to others. I'm Brenda Carl reporting. And our thanks to Greg Hartman and the hundreds of volunteers who come into the prisons all the time in an effort to help inmates change their lives. I'm Mark Vernarelli. More interesting stories coming up in just a moment. Coming up, they look cute and cuddly, but find out why these canines are creating quite a bang. I'm sorry, no more questions. That'll be all. Hi, I'm Michael Kelly. As an actor, sometimes I play a character that has to deal with addiction. But that addiction ends with the word cut. Governor? We're here to tell you about a harsh reality that is having a devastating effect on our nation and in Maryland. I'm Larry Hogan, governor of Maryland. Opioid and heroin addiction affects Marylanders of all ages and demographics, and in particular, our youth. This addiction is destroying families and lives. The governor and I urge you to speak with your kids about the importance of this issue. Please go to mddestinationrecovery.org or call 1-800-422-0009 to find out more information about treatment resources, naloxone, and how to respond to an overdose. Speak with your children before it's too late. Unlike acting, life doesn't have second takes. Welcome back to Inside the Fence and Beyond. I'm Mark Vernarelli for the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Standing here today at the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women and Jessup, the only women's prison in the state. Dynamic warden here named Margaret Chippendale has this place humming with hundreds of programs. I mean, hundreds of positive, life-changing programs to help the ladies here turn their lives around. And one of the most interesting of all the many interesting programs, believe it or not, is Toastmasters. A national survey once found that Americans fear one thing more than death, public speaking. I'm nervous. This is my ice cream. Uh-huh. My name is Brittany Sapp. So why was Brittany Sapp, an inmate at the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women in Jessup, standing petrified before a room full of fellow inmates as part of the Toastmasters public speaking program and telling her gripping life story? I've been through a lot. I really enjoy it and I would like to learn how to, you know, speak more openly and just learn how to word things better. It's definitely helping me come out my shell <laughs> and speak more openly and not be uh, afraid to voice my opinion. SAP is one of about 100 inmates in the Maryland Correctional System who participate in Toastmasters, where they learn public speaking, but so much more, says Women's Facility Warden Margaret Chippendale. Obviously, it's touted as a public speaking forum, but it's so much more than that. It's leadership development. It truly makes the ladies, in this case, come together as a group and develop leadership skills. Chippendale started the program at the suggestion of a former attorney inmate at the Dorsey Run Correctional Facility 13 years ago. She visited a session at nearby Northrop Grumman and met Frank and Karen Story. She coaxed the couple into bringing the program to the men's facility where it still exists. The stories told Chippendale they would only conduct one session. Today, they still work with the inmates, Wednesdays at the women's facility and Saturday mornings with the men. I think it's been the greatest thing that we've ever done. I think the effort the club puts in really makes you want to come back. They put so much into their speeches and so much into their themes, and it's so important to them, it became important to us. From my personal experience, I've learned to stay open and optimistic. Inmate Lauren Dorsey stood in Sapp's position giving her first speech at one time. My first speech, I was nervous and I didn't really know how to properly put together a speech. Recently she gave her 10th speech, a smooth presentation to her fellow inmates about making positive choices to lead a better life. I learned how to communicate better and communication is always key. Dorsey is now an officer in the club. 
I feel like it, it's helped me make better decisions. This holds me accountable. Sap hopes to do the same in becoming a club leader, and though she was nervous in her first speech, she walked out with a different feeling. More confident, definitely. Definitely. And eager to get back up and do another speech now. Now that I've done my first one, I'm ready to do another one. I'm Jerry Shield. And our thanks to Warden Margaret Chippendale and all the hardworking staff here at the Maryland Correctional Institution for Women for the success of that Toastmasters program and all the positive things that they do down here. Another positive thing that's going on in the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services has to do with the K-9 unit. The K-9 unit is actually world-renowned. They do training not only locally but nationally and internationally. They actually have other countries come in and learn about new things in the K-9 unit. And this has been a banner year for the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services K-9 unit because they've recently introduced two dogs with specialized training. The first thing that any special operations group wants to know is where the cannon handles at. They are like the tanks coming in to help the infantry. See? Sergeant George and Alma Rodas is K9 Athena. But we have two certified bombed or de detection dogs now, and they're situated both in the western part of the state and the eastern part of the state. Athena. It was every day we would introduce a different type of explosives odor, and um, she would pick up on it. And you know, she's smart. We're actually finally starting to draw into what they are capable of doing. These dogs are capable of doing a lot more than we know. She's my partner, she's my baby. She, she watches my back and I watch hers. We trained dogs to find cell phones 10 years ago. It would amaze me. But we can train a dog to find anything with any odor at any time. And hats off to the almost 11,000 hardworking men and women in the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services. Without them, we wouldn't have all these positive programs. I'm Mark Vernarelli. Thanks so much again for watching Inside the Fence and Beyond. I'm Secretary Steve Moyer. On behalf of the Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services, thank you for watching.